Good morning, and welcome to your weekly worship service here at First Congregational Church, Milford, New Hampshire. I'm your pastor, Al White. Today is Sunday, January 24th, 2021. I conducted a funeral service on Friday for Jim Heald. Um, even with social distancing, it was still a fairly large number of people because it's a very big family. Um, I hope you will join me in extending our deepest condolences to the entire Heald family. Wednesday is church council meeting at 7.30. Um, the link will be going out that morning. Uh, please join us for coffee hour immediately following this worship service. The link for coffee hour will be going out. Um, you should probably be in your inbox already. So we've got about a dozen people who come on a regular basis, and we would really love to have more of you come and join us. It's quite a lot of fun, and we talk about all kinds of things. So look forward to having you join us. Tomorrow is Robert Burns' birthday. Robert Burns, of course, is the national poet of Scotland. So wear him if you got him. Let us commence our worship. Good morning. Join me for the call of worship. Did you hear the good news? The kingdom of God has drawn near. Do you trust the good news? We place our trust in Jesus one who called us to follow him. Do you have courage to leave your former lives behind? We put our faith in the Lord, our rock, and our salvation. Trust the Lord, and we will follow Jesus. printed in your bulletin. Teach us a new rock of our salvation. Now your kingdom has come near. As you called Simon and Andrew long ago, call us to be your disciples, that we might find refuge in silence, that we might meet you in the subterranean cha chambers of our souls. For in you we rest secure, in you we abide in holy life. Hear us now as we continue, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
Deuteronomy in the Psalter reading, Psalm 62. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will call thee when my heart is faint. Lead thou me to the rock that is higher than I, for thou art my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in this tent forever. Oh, be safe under the shelter of thy wings, for thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those who fear by thy name. For God alone my soul has waited in silence, for the hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be forsaken. O oh God, rest in my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge of God. Trust in him at all times. O oh people, pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. Men of low estate are but a breath. Men of high estate are of delusion. In the balance they will go up. They are together higher than a breath. But no confidence is ex ex extortion. Set no vain hope in robbery. If riches increase, set no other heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that the power belongs to God. And that is to thee, O Lord, Belong steadfast love, for thou dost request a man according to his work. I'd like to talk to the children. Hi, guys. I hope you're doing okay. I hope you're um, learning a lot in your homeschooling. So, today we're going to be talking about Jesus and calling his first disciples. But let me ask you something. What do you do when there's an emergency? Let's say somebody gets really sick or, or somebody gets hurt and if they don't get help right away, they might get worse. What would you do? Well, you'd do what most of us would do. You'd pick up your phone and you'd dial 911. Because 911, when you call 911 and tell the person who answers the phone that you need help right away, their job is to make sure you get help. That person would never say something like, well, I'm sorry, we're really busy right now, we can't help you. Maybe some other time. No, they're going to drop what they're doing and they're going to make sure that you get the help you need. In our Bible story today, Jesus was walking along beside the Sea of Galilee, preaching the good news of God when he made a call for help. He saw Peter and Andrew throwing their net into the water because they were fishermen. And he called out to them and said, Come, follow me, and I will teach you how to fish for people. You know, Jesus wanted Peter and Andrew to help him teach people about God's love. When Jesus called Peter and Andrew, they didn't say, Not right now, we're busy fishing, maybe some other time. No way. The Bible tells us that they left their nets and they followed Jesus. Jesus, Peter, and Andrew had gotten a little further along when they saw James and John sitting in a boat working on fixing their nets. When Jesus saw them, he called to them and said, Hey, come and follow me. And they didn't say, Not right now, we're busy fixing our nets. Maybe some other time. No, the Bible says they left their father sitting in the boat with the hired help and follow Jesus. Jesus is still calling for help today. He's called you and me to help him teach others about God's kingdom. Is it an emergency? I think it is. The Bible says unless you repent, you will not be saved. And Jesus has called us. When Jesus calls us, what do we say? What do we do? I hope that we will drop what we're doing and answer the call. Let's have a prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we want to be thankful in answering the call to be Jesus' disciple. We want to be just like Peter and Andrew, James and John. We want to do what Jesus asks us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Here ends the reading from Mark's Gospel. Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. So in preparing for this sermon today, I remembered that quite a few historians and, and quite a few um, theologians believe that Jesus' ministry really didn't begin until John was arrested. Reza Aslan, in his book, Zealot, makes the case that Jesus was actually a disciple of John the Baptist, who started gathering followers only after John could no longer proclaim the coming kingdom. And today's reading would seem to reinforce that. So in preparing for today's reading, I happened upon an article from the Loyola Press about Biblical Fishing 101 
Reeling in the First Fishers of Faith by James Campbell, who's a doctor of ministry. I learned a lot from it, a lot that I never actually knew. The Sea of Galilee is also known as Lake Genereset, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. It's 13 miles long and 7 miles wide, just a little bit bigger than Lake Winnesquam. In Jesus' time, fishing in the sea was a major source of income and the principal source of protein in the Jewish diet. There are three major species of fish that are taken from the sea. First is a species of tilapia, known locally as St. Peter's fish. Then there are carp, which are bigger than the tilapia, and catfish. Now, Today, um, I learned that the, um, in two, 2010, the Israeli government tried to ban fishing on the, sea, on the Sea of Galilee because the fish stocks had been overfished to the point where they were, they were dropping off. And rather than bringing in millions of pounds of fish every year, they were only bringing in a few thousand pounds. And then there was some kind of a virus affecting the fish as well. Well, in, in doing a little research, I found that the lake has since recovered quite a bit. And they are allowing fishing, though the, the fish landings have been considerably smaller than they would have been. But the Sea of Galilee has been fished continuously for thousands of years. Now, the species, one of the species of fish that's caught there was a catfish. Jews didn't eat catfish because it was considered unclean. It doesn't have fins or scales, and Leviticus 11.19 says, if it doesn't have fins and scales, it's unclean. But they did sell the catfish to Greek communities around the eastern banks of the sea. Most of the fish that they caught were sold locally, dried and salted, and marketed in places like Jerusalem and as far away as Greece. These dried fish were main source of dietary protein in, in the area. You'll notice that meat is very seldom mentioned in the Gospels. There's only one or two spots where it's mentioned. And we know that lamb was eaten during Passover, but fish was the daily staple and the principal protein in the Jewish diet. The fish that weren't big enough to sell or to dry were mixed with the entrails of the bigger fish and kept in vats out in the sun to ferment. Eventually this fermented liquid would be strained and sold as a sauce known as garum that was extremely popular and used in almost every single meal in the Roman Empire. Dealers in this garum could easily make the equivalent of millions of dollars every year. Fishing in Jesus' time was a huge industry with as many as 350 boats working the sea. The boats that they worked were about 23 feet long and about 7 feet wide. They usually had a crew of five, four to row and one to steer and watch out for storms, which in that area pop up rather, rather regularly. These boats could carry as much as a half a ton of fish, and sometimes, as kind of an augmentation of their income, they take passengers, and they could take as many as 11 or 12 passengers. Fishing was highly profitable, but it was hard work. Fishermen would fish at night so that the fish didn't see the nets and swim around and escape. Nylon nets that they use today has eliminated some of that problem. But the nets were made out of either linen or flax. Sometimes two or three boats would work together, especially in deep water, by stringing a net between two boats and then having the third boat drive the fish, kind of like you would a herd of sheep. During the day, the nets would be washed, repaired, dried, folded, and ready for the night's fishing to come. Peter and Andrew were very successful, and they were partnered with James and John. They, they were so successful that they had a house in Capernaum, which was very unusual for anyone living in the first century, as the land was dominated mostly by large estates, 
and menial laborers that lived in other people's rented properties. Fishing was so important to the local economy that fishermen were allowed to work on the Sabbath, if they wanted to. There are recorded accounts of complaints because many of the fishermen chose to worship in the synagogue rather than go out and work. When Jesus approaches Peter and Andrew, and then James and John, he was inviting successful men to give up their business and follow him. Now just think about that. These are successful, successful fishermen that had built themselves a pretty good business. And Jesus asked them, drop what you're doing and come with me. Jesus promises to make them fishers of people. But that phrase may not be quite as accurate as you need. When you fish for something, the goal is to catch the fish. And then what you do with the fish afterwards is kind of secondary. But being a faithful disciple is not so much about is not so much a task as it is an identity. Once you've, once you've brought somebody in as a disciple, it doesn't end there. It has to still be nurtured and grown, and our faith has to continually be nurtured and grown. Being a disciple means putting our faith to work. Being the actual people that Jesus calls us to be. Not the people that we think we are, but the people that we are called to be. But it isn't realistic in today's world for us to just drop everything and go off following Jesus. How would we pay our bills? What it does call for us to be, to be faithful disciples, it calls on us to know what God calls us to do. To know what Jesus' instruction means for us. To be the actual people that Jesus calls us to be. In, in Andrew and Peter's day, being successful at fishing or almost anything was a, pre a pretty unusual thing. Most people in that time were completely dependent on other people. But realistically, dedicating ourselves to offering our best to God is something we can do. To not be obsessed with obtaining more than we need, to pursue justice and equality among all of our fellow beings, even the ones we don't like. To help provide for those in need, those struggling, those who we can help. To be friend to the friendless, to be help to those who need it. Those are the ways we can become faithful disciples. Those are the, way, those are the ways we can truly follow Jesus. There's an old song that says, they'll know we are Christians by our love. And I would say, they'll know we are Christians by our deeds done in love. So when you hear that call, it doesn't mean you have to walk away from everything. It means you have to reorient yourself to making sure that you are doing the things that Christ calls us all to do. Hallelujah and Amen.
please keep Nancy Schooley and the Heald family in our prayers. Of course, Nancy's son passed away last weekend um, after a long bout with cancer. And Jim Heald passed away the following day. Please pray with me. O oh God, who changes rivers in their courses and alters the paths of distant stars, come now and direct us to new ways of thinking and living that will bring us into perfect joy in you. Help us to be willing to risk everything in pursuit of your kingdom. Speak vibrantly to those among us whose minds are tired or bored or locked in routine. Rekindle happiness in those whose hearts have been heavy with loss and grief. Restore sparkle to the eyes of those who feel defeated or broken. Set the cross once more in our midst and remind us of the life that springs out of death and the hope that rises from despair. Let all our problems and illness be but a turning in the road that brings us back to you. And then bestow new energy, new understanding, new imagination upon us. We commit to your care our children that they may know and love you. Our elderly that they may rejoice in your strength and care. Our visitors that they may prosper in all that they do. Our friends and our loved ones who are ill, that they may trust in you for healing. The leaders of our world, that they may bow down to you and your will for the nations and our church, that it may serve you with gladness and joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. kingdom people, 
for the realm of God has come near. Let us go with God's blessing. Go as God's people, for that is who we are. We go in the refuge of our rock and our salvation. Go as those who believe the good news, for that is our daily bread. We go to live as people of justice, mercy, and grace. Amen. Thank you.